Hi everyone, my name is Anusha Noy Bhangli and I am a staff radiologist at the Mass General Hospital. Um, disclosure, this is a talk that I recently gave at SAR 2023 and my topic uh, relates to post-surgical imaging evaluation following surgery for endometriosis. I shall be focusing mainly on uh, MRI findings. This is our multidisciplinary team and I want to acknowledge here because without this team, any of the work that I'm interested in doing would not have been possible at all. Now, uh, as far as objectives for this next 15 to 20 minutes are, in addition to post-surgical imaging appearances, specifically MR appearances, I'm gonna discuss a little bit about how we can distinguish fibrosis from recurrent disease patient population, uh, talk about the expected post-surgical and post-procedural complications, as well as talk to you about some common indications for imaging after endometriosis surgery, because uh, currently there is no indication for routine post-surgical imaging. So we shall also look at certain specific circumstances when imaging after surgery is uh, truly indicated. So um, for just like um, when you are interpreting in a reading room post-surgical imaging appearance for any surgery, it is very important to know the surgical technique that was used and it is also um, important to compare with any post-surgical imaging whenever it is available. So this is a list of some of the surgical procedures that these patients can undergo depending on the location and extent of the disease. However, uh, one must remember that while um, surgically treating patients with endometriosis, there is no one size that fits all. Endometriosis can present either as superficial implants deep infiltrating disease or endometriomas. And as we know, this is a multi-organ, multi-system disease, and therefore it can involve multiple pelvic organs as well as extra pelvic organs. So the type of surgery depends on the location and the phenotypic expression of the disease. Um, it is also important to know that local surgical expertise and the patient's wishes in terms of how aggressive the surgeon can be are also very important factors that determine what the surgical procedure eventually looks like. So here is a patient at the beginning of the laparoscopic procedure, as you can see this laparoscopic image on the left, there is obliteration of the posterior cul-de-sac. There are rectal wall infiltrates as shown by this star here. And this rectovaginal nodule creates the classic mushroom cap sign infiltrating the anterior rectal wall. In addition, you also see large infiltrates involving the bilateral uterosacral ligaments. So here is the immediate post-surgical laparoscopic appearance where the surgeon has beautifully excised um, the entire rectovaginal nodule as well as implants on the posterior vaginal fornix. And he has successfully created closure and re-establishment of the posterior cul-de-sac as you can see here. This is another patient. The extent of disease involvement is less compared to our first patient. Um, and the disease is seen merely in the form of superficial endometriotic plaques on the bilateral uterosacral ligaments. So this is the immediate post-surgical laparoscopic image um, and what it would look like following excision of the bilateral uterosacral ligaments, as well as excision of the posterior peritoneum for removing those superficial implants. In a patient that has undergone this type of surgical procedure, MRI a few years later can look like this, where there is distortion of the posterior vaginal fornix. Um, there are telltale signs of surgery having been performed along the posterior surface of the uterus and cervix, and you can see thin filmy fibrosis bridging the cervix to the anterior rectal wall. And in this particular patient, there is a small um, um, peritoneal inclusion cyst as well. Here, the patient has urinary tract involvement by deep endometriosis. As you can see, there are T2 hypointense plaques infiltrating the ureter, as well as the adjacent bladder wall, giving rise to um, hydroureter on the same side. The surgery that this patient underwent was excising these plaques involving the ureter, as well as the plaque involving the adjacent bladder wall, and because the plaques were extensive, the ureter had to be reimplanted with creation of a psoas hitch. And this is what it can look like with distortion of the bladder contour, as well as the ureter, the shortened ureter now reimplanted at another site on the bladder wall. In this patient, 
there was um, biopsy proven scar endometriosis involving the left anterior pelvic wall. Now this patient didn't go for um, surgery, but instead they had cryoablation. So cryoablation is a minimally invasive technique that can be offered to patients with scar endometriosis. And it is typically done by our interventional radiology colleagues um, with, less, with early recovery following the procedure and less complications. And here is what the MRI obtained after a few months can look like. Sometimes distinguishing scar left by these minimally invasive procedures from recurrent disease can be challenging. Scar can also cause pain, recurrent disease can also cause pain, um, and one must be careful in distinguishing the two. Now, um, I want to pay particular, uh, I want to describe two specific uh, circumstances um, on imaging as related to impact of um, endometriosis on fertility. Now, as we all know, the prevalence of endometriosis in patients with infertility is almost as high as 50%. And so in this patient population desiring of future pregnancy, if we happen to come across an MRI, um, there are certain specific points that we could pay attention to and describe in our reports. Um, and I'm gonna start off by showing you the uterine findings that we should pay attention to. And why is that? So the prevalence of adenomyosis in endometriosis is almost 96.3% as described in the literature and vice versa, the presence of adenomyosis in patients with endometriosis is as high as 91%. So when both these coexist, that is deep infiltrating disease and adenomyosis coexist, the chance of pregnancy is said to be less than 68%. And so uh, it is also said that if these patients undergo surgical um, management rather than only hormone therapy management, um, there is increased chance of pregnancy, however, depending on how aggressive the surgery might be, particularly pertaining to the uterus and adenomyosis, there can be increased chance of uterine rupture. And so this paper that came out in 2016 describes a safe myometrial thickness to be left behind, a safe normal myometrial thickness to be left behind, as in the range of nine to 15 millimeters. And they say that if about seven millimeters of normal remnant myometrium from the endometrium to the serosa is left behind, then that increases the success of future pregnancies and prevents the incidence of uterine rupture in this patient population. The second um, uh, post-surgical appearances or um, things on pre-surgical MRI that we can report in patients desiring of fertility are related to ovarian factors. So this is a patient uh, getting an MRI after two prior laparoscopic surgeries for endometriosis, for excising endometriotic implants. And um, you can see this right ovary here has two small follicles. Within the left ovary, the large, uh, larger follicles are pushed to the side, but there is a sizable endometrioma within that ovary. Um, so what is important to report? Now, endometriomas are the manifestation of endometriosis that do not respond merely to medical management, but these have to be excised surgically. Now, surgical excision, as you can imagine, can decrease the ovarian reserve because in addition to removing the endometriotic cyst, some amount of normal surrounding ovarian parenchyma also gets excised during this procedure. And it has been said that in patients who desire fertility, cystectomy decreases recurrence of um, endometriomas and improves the chance of pregnancy, particularly when the endometriomas are more than three centimeters uh, in size and some centers also use four centimeters as cutoff. Our, places, our place uses four centimeters um, as a cutoff. And therefore, for us, it is important to report not only the size of the endometriomas as best as we can, but also the number and laterality of ovarian endometriomas. Um, now, moving on to the concept of how to identify recurrent disease from fibrosis. Here, is, here are sagittal T2 and post-contrast images in a patient many years after stage four endometriosis surgery. And you can see this thin T2 hypo intense fibrotic band bridging the vaginal wall to the anterior rectal wall with delayed post-contrast enhancement, a little bit of tethering of the anterior rectal wall, but not a lot of distortion of the pelvis. And this is merely fibrosis in a patient many years later. Um, and fortunately she has been asymptomatic all this time. How about this patient? She presented a year later after stage four now, the staging here is laparoscopic staging. We do not yet have a robust MRI staging that we routinely use. 
So this patient presented a year later after stage four endometriosis surgery with recurrent symptoms. And what I've outlined here is a thicker T2 hypo intense band extending from the vaginal vault to the anterior rectal vault. And you might rightly recognize a mushroom cap sign um, here. This thick band also enhances. So now what are the features of recurrent disease? Uh, recurrent disease can look like nodular regrowth. Um, it is important to look for presence of T2 hyperintense foci within this speculated T2 hypointense nodular tissue because these T2 hyperintense foci truly represent endometrial glands. So if you see those glands redeveloping in patients after surgery, then you must um, worry that there is recurrence of disease. And then, of course, additional sites of disease. In this particular patient, uh, the right ovary was left behind. And now, um, unfortunately, the right ovary presents with an endometrioma. Moving on to post-surgical complications in this patient population. This is a paper that came out in 2020. And this was written by one of the uh, minimally invasive surgeons that uh, I'm fortunate to work with. Uh, and this paper is from Boston. So uh, they looked at 397 women who underwent um, surgery for endometriosis, all three phenotypes of endometriosis. And they noted that in about four and a half percent, there were major complications, either as bowel and bladder injuries at the time of surgery or post-op infections or intra or post-surgical development of fistulizing disease, either rectovaginal or utrovaginal fistulae. And they noted that there was no way to predict uh, there were no patient characteristics, no preoperative imaging or disease severity at the time of surgery could predict which patient would land up with a major complication. They did see some correlation and some predictors between the extent of adhesiolysis they did, whether they did urethrolysis or not, and the overall total number of procedures that these patients uh, underwent, uh, they found some correlation with prediction of major complications. So these are some examples of the complications, uh, specific complications that these patients um, might exhibit. Um, one is, uh, so this is a posterior um, pelvic abscess in this patient who underwent rectal plaque excision. Um, following bilateral oocyte retrieval, this patient developed bilateral tubovarian abscesses. Um, and then here is a patient that had biopsy proven scar endometriosis who, unlike our previous patient, didn't undergo cryoablation, but underwent scar excision. Um, and although I'm showing you this MRI, you can see that there is thinning of the anterior um, rectus muscle. Uh, the rectus muscle has been excised along with the scar endometriosis. Um, this patient is lying supine, but the complaint that she came in with was a sizable bulge when she stands up at the site of prior um, excision. And so technically, she developed an incisional hernia at the site of excision of scar endometriosis. Um, now, post-surgical imaging is still not the standard of norm in this patient population. So what are the indications for obtaining such imaging? Um, and this imaging specifically I'm talking of is MRI. Um, unsuspected disease at laparoscopy for other indications. What do I mean by this? At, I'll show you a nice example to explain this. Uh, sometimes, there is incomplete excision of endometriosis at surgery. Uh, pa uh, patients do not desire very aggressive surgery. And so the surgeon knows that they have left behind disease. And so they may obtain post-surgical imaging to monitor this leftover disease. Uh, I'm going to show you an example of this concept as well. Of course, if the patients present with recurrent symptoms, particularly pain, um, then that is a valid indication to reobtain imaging. And lastly, any symptoms, early or delayed, suggestive of complications um, should also get post-surgical imaging. Here is a 37-year-old lady presenting with heavy menstrual bleeding, pelvic and bladder pressure for some time. Um, when they went in for performing laparoscopic myomectomy, they noted stage 4 endometriosis with extensive disease. Now, the surgeon decided not to address this as the patient was already under anesthesia, and this was an unexpected finding at laparoscopy performed with the intent of doing myomectomy in this patient. And therefore, since this was unexpected, uh, nothing was done and an MRI was obtained after the surgery. You can see the scar from myomectomy in the anterior uterine wall. And the patient has um, extensive deep, deep infiltrating disease involving the posterior cul-de-sac. There is a right-sided 
um, endometrioma, the right ovary is pulled back um, or, and is located along the posterior surface of the uterus. And it's not very clear here, but the circle that I've drawn here actually shows involvement of the appendix with endometriosis. Um, and so th this is one of the indications where we might obtain MRI to further stage the disease. So this MR can um, function as a pre-surgical mapping for the subsequent surgery that this patient might undergo if she desires uh, surgical management of endometriosis. Here is a patient that had an MRI 12 years ago, and the MR was performed when they presented to the ER with sudden onset left pelvic pain. What was noticed was a ruptured hemorrhagic cyst um, and hemoperitoneum um, that caused her to present to the ER. When she went in for laparoscopic treatment or laparoscopic management, they found superficial endometriosis in this patient. They decided to monitor her. However, she was lost to follow up from our system. And the subsequent MRI in our system is this MR from two years prior. Um, she has, pay attention to this left adnexa here. She was continued to monitor. And you can see that on the most recent MRI, she has implants along the left cornu. This is a T1 hyperintense spec here, and there are some features of endosalpingiosis along the surface um, on the left cornu. And as you can see, her uterus also shows some features of adenomyosis. So uh, in the first instance, there was incomplete excision. They hadn't done extensive management for endometriosis surgery. So she was followed up by imaging. And therefore, occasionally, this is also a valid indication for obtaining um, imaging following initial surgery. This is a lady with a long history of severe pelvic pain, dyskesia, who on her MRI demonstrates these torus uterinus plaques here um, and endometriomas in both the ovaries. Uh, the left, so the surgery that she underwent subsequently was laparoscopic hysterectomy, uh, not bilateral salpingo oophorectomy, actually, it should be only left oophorectomy, excision of pelvic adhesions. And intraoperatively, the sigmoid colon was noted to be okay. So they didn't proceed with any surgery for the sigmoid colon. This is the same patient that I showed you an example earlier for recurrent disease. As you can see here, there is a mushroom cap sign. Um, there are deep infiltrating implants now extending to the anterior rectal wall. Um, and the right ovary was left behind. She developed a recurrent endometrioma in the right ovary. And therefore, this is another indication where if the patients are uh, symptomatic or they demonstrate repeat symptoms after the initial surgical management, then obtaining a repeat MRI is truly indicated. And this patient is scheduled for um, segmental bowel resection and right salpingophorectomy. So this brings us to uh, our last slide. Um, so the take-home messages include, in order to interpret these scans correctly, knowledge of surgical technique is very important because one size does not fit all in patients with endometriosis. Um, uh, distinguishing fibrosis versus, versus recurrent disease can be challenging. And it is important to look for those tiny T2 hyperintense foci within T2 hypointense areas, suggestive of glands that might suggest recurrent disease. Aggressive surgery for deep infiltrating endometriosis can have morbid complications and therefore knowledge of complications can help early detection and guiding the surgeons in the right direction. And there are definitely indications for imaging after endometriosis surgery, which include recurrent symptoms, monitoring for incomplete excision, complications, or um, in patients that endometriosis accidentally discovered at laparoscopy. And with that, thank you. These are my references, and I'm gonna stop here open for any questions. Thank you, Anu. That was awesome. Um, I do have a question. Yes. Um, when you were talking about adenomyosis surgery yes. and you showed um, measurement of the myometrium. Yes. Um, so adenomyosis usually spreads from the endometrium into the myometrium, right? So it's interesting, Aarti. Even the uh, tissue that looks like adenomyosis, which spreads from outside to inside, is also called adenomyosis. So, uh, for example, in this patient, this looks like adenomyosis. Th this area also looks like adenomyosis. This 
is in contiguity with the junctional zone or endometrium, whereas this uh, uh, portion here goes all the way up to the surface. So currently, we don't have a different terminology. Um, you know, we've seen patients where there is intervening normal myometrium, and what looks like adenomyosis is actually spanning from the surface into the myometrium, which is also currently, for lack of a better terminology, called the same. So that's that's what I meant. Got it, got it. But in general, most of the time, adenomyosis is spreading from the endometrium into the myometrium. Usually there isn't a gap. Yes. And so we're supposed to measure, in this case, it's almost like there is no myometrium on top Correct. of um, where this, this adenomyoma extends to the surface there. Correct. Okay. Um, but if we saw myometrium there, we should measure that. I was just looking up an yes. article while you were talking because I realized I don't know how they treat I don't know myosis really, like how, how surgically they treat it. And I, I saw a paper that showed different um, pictures of it, but basically it looks like a lot of times they come from the outside, open up the serosa, yes. slice open the myo the myometrium, and then they scoop out wow. the adenomyoma. Exactly. And then they have to like stitch up the, the myometrium and there's in, different intricate ways to exactly. do it, like with overlapping muscle to try to make sure exactly. it doesn't dehiss. Yes. Um, so that makes a lot of sense of like, they need to at least have some small amount of tissue of that myometrium to sew it up together. Yes. Okay. And uh, that's what they say. If the, if the, if the so-called adenomyosis is more external, and they're going to excise this, then the measurement from the endometrium to uh, from the uh, yeah endometrium to whatever is going to be left behind of the serosa, there should be at least seven millimeter normal myometrium there. Got it. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay, we can go on to our interesting cases. Thank you, Arti. Yeah, thank you. So this is a cold case, actually. This is a, a young female who came with left flank pain. And this was the CT that we had. So does any, anything catch your eye, residents? Do you want me to just do a show and tell? Uh, we can do either. The Trinity residents are, I think they're, yeah, they're unmuted. So residents, what do you guys think? Yeah. The kidney? Left kidney? Yeah, there's some okay. uh, abnormality of the left kidney. Okay, so what's your differential? Uh, infarct. infarct versus pilo, yeah. Exactly, okay. So that's, so the resident favored pilo since it was like left flank pain. And uh, there were a couple of other findings actually. I favored inf an infarct for another reason. You see the reason? Is there a clot in the? Yeah, is there? There's a filling defect within the apex of the left ventral. Exactly. So yes. the papillary muscle is enhancing more than this area. This is very round, so this is actually a left ventricular thrombus with an infarct. And um, so this is an infarct. Now there is no differential of pilo, right? Because what's the chance of pilo with with an LV clot? It's extremely unlikely. And then another finding that actually was overlooked. Do you see anything here on this image? The right abdominal wall. Probably hematoma or some yep. sort of. Yep, perfect. So it is hyperdense. So hematoma is probably statistically the most likely finding. But if you follow it here, oh. there is a vessel. So does this sway you away from hematoma or to confirm hematoma? Like a pseudo So there's some like vascularity that's supplying this, and it seems a little bit heterogeneous. So we said solid mass versus uh, hematoma, as you mentioned. And if it was a solid mass, then it would be a nice story, right? Because it would be, okay, malignancy, hypercalculable state, thrombus, uh, infarct. So everything would be like one nice big story. So what would you recommend for this to see what it is? Could you just do a Doppler and see? Exactly. We can just do an ultrasound. So we did an ultrasound and it looks very hypoechoic and it has almost tiny cystic spaces in it. And it does have color flow in it. Do you, so it's not a hematoma. It doesn't look like a hematoma, it has vascularity. Do you feel that the imaging appearance is typical of anything, this ultrasound appearance?
So here's a nice thing that uh, the sonographer actually told me, which I put in the findings as well. So the patient felt this after C-section eight years ago, and the pain increases during menstrual cycle. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. So what's this? Do you have a diagnosis? So it's like an endometrial implant. Exactly. So that's an endometrioma. So unfortunately, now the story does not fit back together. They have to work her up for a hypercoagulable state. But it was nice. Uh, a diagnosis without having to go to biopsy because I was thinking, oh, if this is a mess, then the next step will be biopsy. But then since it was very typical on imaging and in history, then I just read this as endometrioma and no need for further workup. So that was a good case because it has like a sudden finding and then it has endometriosis, which ties nicely to Anu's, uh, to Anu's great talk. I'm going to show two more cases of endometriosis because this is the theme. Uh, so let's see this one. These are more unusual. It's not the bread and butter endometriosis. Okay. okay, so this case is similar in two ways. In a way, there's a filling defect in the vessel. So in a way, there's a clot. And in a way, there is something related to endometriosis. So this is actually an older lady with uh, an established diagnosis, but I wanted to show you this because it's very impressive. So if you follow this clot down, where is it coming from? Um, Left. No, but I can, I can find your... Um, an iliac it keeps going. Yeah. Uh, and which, which left iliac, internal or external? Looks like it continues internally. Exactly. So this is internal left iliac vein. Based on the density and in the expansivity of the vessel, do you think this is acute or chronic? Uh, I would think chronic. The vessel would be atrophic and small. It might be calcified. If it is big, then it is either acute with like a component of thrombophlebitis and expansion, or it is not even a clot. It is like a solid mass. Ooh. Yeah. like a tumor in vein technically, but actually if you follow this back down to the pelvis, the patient has this aggressive pelvic lesion, ah. which is invading the rectum and which actually extend to the vein. And then we're gonna move on to the MR, let's put a T2. This is an old case, so the images are not great, but if you follow, this is actually the internal iliac vein and you see this, let me try to window it differently. T2 hypointense lesion with tiny cystic spaces that is extending into the vein. It's very dark. So this is actually endometriosis, pathology proven endometriosis extend with intravenous extension. So this was all endometriosis invading That's the insane. rectum. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's amazing. This is an only case that I've seen of like venous invasion by endometriosis. But always watch out for expensile clot. It's either acute or it's a tumor or like soft tissue. Malik, I have a question about your first case because we tend to do a lot of MRI here, um, more than ultrasound actually. So that first, like in general, if I think something might be endometrioma or endometriosis, I usually recommend an MRI because then you can see these cystic spaces like you were showing in this vein. But then you can also see if there's additional areas like deep infiltrating endometriosis. Do you think that's valid to go for an MRI? The considerations, this was actually a Sunday morning and MR is much harder to arrange. Ultrasound is much cheaper. My, I was not thinking, I, I mean, I knew endometrioma was in the differential for that, just given the CT appearance. But my main concern was, is this a malignancy? Does, do we need to work, up, work her up urgently for a biopsy of a tissue, soft tissue mass? So when I was thinking, I just want to see if this is hematoma or tumor to expedite this young lady's workup. I was just like, is there vascularity or no? I don't care to know what it is. I just want to know, is the next step biopsy or is the next step something else? Does that make sense? It does. But um, I think then, for example, you said the history saved you from doing the biopsy, but I think an MRI would also save you from doing the biopsy. I mean, history but is I, for free though. What'd you say? History is for free. Yes, 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 but they don't always have that history. Like I have pap proven endometrial scar endometrial yeah. that didn't yeah, get agree. Like, so I think MRI would definitely provide better confidence. And the other thing that it will provide, it will provide a more uh, objective evaluation of the size and stuff like that, especially if you're concerned about stability. Ultrasound is nice because if your sonographers are good and if you bug them enough, they will take very good history of the patient and this will be extremely useful. Agree, agree. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, I have one more case of um, 
Uh, let's see if you'll if you'll pick it up actually. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. This is another. Uh, this is a busy pelvis. This is a fibroid uterus, which also has focal adenomyosis here. But there's a finding outside the uterus. Oops, sorry, there's a measurement on it. Okay. So any thoughts? Can you show us the T1, please? Yeah. And maybe another plane. Uh, let me see how easy is the T1. On this one, I see a loss of fat plane with the rectum. Yeah, but one other finding, I'm actually just going to show the findings because the, I think uh, this was, I don't have a normal axial T1. I just have axial T1 post con because this was like a MRA. T1, contrast, and uh, I wanted to show you actually two findings. One is if you look at the rectal wall, there is this well-defined hypointense nodule, which is an endometriosis deposit. And then another location, which is not that common, but I've seen actually in two or three cases only. Do you see, does anything stand out on this image? Anything that's not symmetric? The round ligament? Uh, like the inguinal canal there? Yeah. 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 So technically in females, this is the canal of NUC. Canal of NUC, yeah. And this is actually biopsy proven canal of NUC endometriosis. I've seen it in another lady as well. And uh, you see it's hypoechoic with a hypo intense on T2 with internal cystic spaces. So, so this is canal of NAC endometriosis. We also have a few cases of these. So these are unusual locations that I've seen, the endovenous, the canal of NAC. Any questions? Super cool. Can you uh, trace it back? Like, does it connect or is it disconnected? Just curious. Uh, doesn't, we don't, uh, maybe actually it does. It connects, yeah. Yeah, here's the round ligament, yeah. It actually connects, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So this was an interesting case. So this was a 50 year old male who came in with uh, shortness of breath. And if anyone is seeing something you can mention, stop me. Then I'll keep going. PE. -E. Yeah. Bilateral PE and then in the, and anything in the upper abdomen. Abnormal right kidney. Yeah. So there was a asymmetric uh, hyper enhancement of the right kidney with a lot of calculi. It's enlarged too. So they proceeded to, let's see, I pull up the abdomen. They converted into an abdomen and pelvis. So this is the old venous phase. So any tarts? He only came in for shortness of breath. He's 50 year old male. Residents, what do you think? Uh, so there's no, non-symmetric enhancement of the kidneys. And then obviously there's like a venous filling defect yeah. within the right renal vein. I think we saw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what do you think? Uh, would that be tumor infiltration from like an RCC? Um, any differentials? Let's just be another client. I have an MRI, like they went on to do an MRI. Yeah, there was a concern for malignancy that was raised, so they went in to do the MRI. Let me show you. So this is T2 weighted images showing the same calculi with the layering fluid flow level, infiltration, and then I'll show you the coronal post contrast, which is impressive. We can in general think of renal tumors as mass forming versus infiltrative. And when you say infiltrative, or if you, if you say RCC, would you think it would be more mass forming or more, more infiltrative? Just, if we just hear the word RCC.
Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mass forming. So if, if I say infiltrative tumor in the kidney, what would you think? Or infiltrative process? Transitional cells? TCC, excellent. If I say infiltrative tumor anywhere in the body, which is the great mimicker of, I mean, TV is the great mimicker of, infiltrative tumor in general, what do you think? A tumor that surrounding structure, lymphoma, exactly. So always have these, these in mind. That's good. <laughs> yeah, these are great thoughts. Yes, these were one of the couple of differentials that was given for this patient. Um, infection and in, like tuberculosis was also considered. So this patient went on to get, have a nephrectomy. This turned out to be a squamous cell carcinoma of the kidney. It was a primary squamous cell. So it's very rare tumor. So I just want to show this. So in case like uh, patients have like chronic stones, chronic inf infection or inflammation, they are prone to get a squamous cell carcinoma of the kidney, which is less than 1% that's prevalence that's reported. And uh, the clues will be like, they can be infiltrative or solid mass forming, but when you want to differentiate, and the most common differential that people think of is XGP because of the calculi that the patients usually presents with and hydro uh, hydronephrosis some patients can have. XGP is commonly considered as the common differential. So when you see a mass, whether it's like hypoenouncing or an enhancing mass, always consider malignancy in the differential. And squamous cell carcinoma can present like any, any of the tumors, but infiltrative process can also be one of them. And this patient had like tumor thrombus um, in, extending all the way into the IVC. So malignancy was high on the differential, but um, for theoretical Parts, like if you consider infiltrative infections, tuberculosis, XGP, all these also will be in the consideration. So just wanted to show like a squamous cell carcinoma of the kidney. That's a great case. I have a couple of points here. One, um, like Malik said, infiltrative always bring up the full differential like RCC, urothelial, and lymphoma because they're all treated very differently. And so often they will biopsy the lesion first because RCC goes for a nephrectomy, Urethelial goes for nephro-ureterectomy, so they resect the entire ureter, and then lymphoma often will go for chemotherapy, not uh, nephrectomy at all. And then another point here, there was a, it looked like those stones were like layering in something, so there might have been a calocele diverticulum with stones in it, um, so that, you know, that might have led to the chronic inflammation, but although it doesn't look like the tumor is centered in that thing itself. Yes. And then the third thing I wanted to say on the MRI, if you see that um, the IVC, the thrombus, some of it is enhancing and then some of it isn't, right? So yeah. the black part of it is actually bland thrombus. And so my surgeons always want me to tell them what where the tumor thrombus ends and where the bland thrombus begins. Usually the bland thrombus will be underneath, like the tumor thrombus will be growing up the IVC and the bland thrombus will be below it because there's stasis. Um, but they always want us to tell them like, where's truly tumor thrombus. So like how high up the IVC do they need to resect? Do they need to involve liver surgeons and like what, you know, what part is tumor versus bland? So I feel like this is a good example. Yeah, that's a good case. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have another case once. So, so this is a 20, 22 year old male who presented with a uh, few last few months of like chronic uh, uh, urinary uh, irritation, UTI, uh, 25 pound weight loss. So they did, and uh, this was the second CT, but this was done with contrast. So it was showing it better. So I'm just showing it. So this was what he presented with. So 20 year old male, 22 year old male with this differentials. Pull up the I think with a large mass like this, it is important to know where it is. And mm -hmm. the way to tell is to see where is it displacing the surrounding structures. So the questions are, is it peritoneal or retroperitoneal or extraperitoneal, I guess? Yes. I'll show you the sagittal. This was too big that... Uh, the, the it, it was extraperitoneal, but like it was difficult to delineate uh, the other structures was just displacing everything, but this was extraperitoneal. And if I show on the coronal, it will be better, I guess. So the mass was more kind of towards the right pelvis, but the majority of the mass was in the lower abdomen. If you show the bone window, 
I can show you. Now, any clues? I don't know if it's projecting. I'm thinking about some kind of like sarcoma, like a regular sarcoma or leiomyosarcoma. And then I showed a gist last week that was huge in the pelvis. Like, so those can arise from, from uh, bowel, but they don't usually, I've never seen one kind of go into that obturator mm -hmm. frame and like into the pelvis like that. Yeah, this was this was a path proven even sarcoma from the right superior pubic bone. The soft tissue mass component was the majority, but you can see like a small little um, lytic lesion with some cortical bone disruption here. But the soft tissue mass was the one which was predominantly impressive looking. This whole thing was an evening sarcoma. So I've never seen one. So I thought I would just share it too. Because in males with the pelvic mass, the differentials are pretty limited. But I thought like, uh, we'll show this case. He didn't have any other masses, but it was just compressing the ureters, causing like these symptoms. He was saying like his abdominal girth was increasing, but like 25 pound weight loss. He's responding pretty decent with the chemotherapy now, but uh, this was like a sarcoma. Like other differentials to consider will be a lymphoma um, or other kind of sarcomas that are rising, sometimes like the schwannomas um, arising from the nerve sheath tumors from the pelvis can also be um, pretty large and necrotic because of its large size. So I just want to share this case. These are also very, the pelvic location of the evening sarcoma is pretty low as well. It's like um, about like 15 to 20% location. Most of these are like predominantly bone centric and other extra osseous locations are very rare. Yeah. Yeah. Anu, I have a comment. Um, you said it was arising, you think, from the bone, but I would argue that it's probably in, invading the bone. Like they can arise from soft tissues and it seems like the bone is not as abnormal to be the yeah. primary versus like you have the soft tissue Ewing sarcoma that's true. They can arise from the primarily from the soft tissues too. Yeah. So those are my cases. Awesome. Okay, so there is a process going on here. You can see that there's thickening of the bowel loops and then there's all this kind of like soft tissue and inflammatory stuff. So we thought, you know, this kind of could be an enteritis. It could be some kind of associated phlegmon. The patient did not have any history of inflammatory bowel disease. This was the axial and I'm gonna show you the coronal. We've got the tissue thickening. And one of my colleagues picked up something on this image. Fishbone. I think one interesting observation is that the bowel loop on the right, the right side wall of it is very normal, whereas the left side has very asymmetric thickening. If it was infectious or inflammatory process, you'd expect the entire loop to be affected more or less. Okay. And it also looks like an extrinsic process on the surface, right? Rather than intrinsic to bowel. Exactly. And I think Anu said it. So yeah. you can see that there's this faint linear structure here that was actually a fishbone. So, um, or a bone of some kind, but the patient, I guess, had recently had fish. So we've shown a lot of fish bones here. This is just another interesting example, um, causing a big phlegmon and enteritis of the adjacent bowel. So it's extruded from the bowel. So they're very thin. And another point I wanted to make is if you go back to the, so you can see it on the coronal better than you can see it on the axial. And at our institution, we um, our axials are five millimeter reconstructions and our coronals are three millimeter reconstructions. So sometimes like you'll see something faint, for example, like a faint kidney calcification. And then on the coronal, you can clearly see a kidney stone. And this lesion, this example too, like you can barely see the fish bone here, but then on the coronal, you can see it. So um, I don't know if you guys have that same protocol, but I do find it helpful to like really look at the coronals and anytime you see some unexplained inflammatory process, you know, look for any thin linear things here. Okay. Uh, Kala said foreign body and Malik said nice, nice. Okay. Um, um, so this was a female patient who, oops.
I'm going to withhold some history. And um, there's a finding on this image. Arti, I'll give someone else a chance because I think I know what's going on there. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny? I, I first learned about this from a lecture from Avinash. So I feel like maybe you guys do it. Oh, nice. Me. Yeah. <laughs> and even recently at uh, SAR, somebody oh. had shown the case. So. Okay, I'll, I'll draw your attention to this area. Somebody called me and asked me, like, what's going on next to the colon? And I'll tell you, it wasn't the appendix, because this is the TI here. And the appendix was somewhere else. I, I can't see it here, but um, it was not the appendix. Can I give a clue to people? Is it an isolated uh, tick? Uh, good thought. Um, that thing, it looks like a diverticulum, but it's not. And I'll, I'll point out something else. There is some structure going into it. And first I was like, oh, is that the appendix going into it? And it's like an enhancing appendiceal mass, like a neuroendocrine tumor. But when you follow that structure back, it's right here. And it goes to the IVC. And there's been a removal of the uterus, right? Some surgical clips in the pelvis? Yep. So uterus is out. This is the structure oh. of interest. Is it a gonadal vein? Yeah, so this is the gonadal vein going to back to the IVC. And so what is the structure? The ovary? Yeah. <laughs> oh, they, they re-implanted the ovary? Exactly. So this is an ovary. This is a corpus luteum. Nice. And this patient had had cervical cancer. And um, so when they, sometimes when they do um, hysterectomy and then they're going to do radiation, they'll do something called oophoropexy where they pull the ovaries out of the pelvis and tack them up in the upper abdomen so that they're out of the radiation field. So that's what they did for this patient. So her ovary was tacked up here and just an unusual location because of her cervical cancer and radiation. Um, and then bonus is that we found the, because then we're like, where's the other ovary? So we found the gonadal vein on the other side. So we traced from the renal vein um, down. This is the gonadal vein on this side um, here. And it went all the way out here. And we're like, huh, how come this ovary is not very big? Or doesn't really, you know, it's not very apparent. And so it turns out after they did the hysterectomy and they did um, salpingectomy and they tacked up the two ovaries, this left fallopian tube came back with incidental mesothelioma. So they went back in and resected the tacked up left ovary. Um, so that's why there's no ovary on the side. So anyway, just an interesting case of an oophoropexy um, in a patient with cervical cancer. So if something looks weird, but it reminds you of something in a different part of the body, think about like why it could be there. Like this kind of reminds you of a corpus luteum. So you know, think about the ovary and then what is it connected to? In this case, it was connected to the gonadal vein. Okay, I'm gonna stop first. Okay, this one is for the residents. Um, so we have some findings here. What do you guys think? Uh, multiple. Low density lesions of the bilateral so as at least so as it looks like maybe some involvement of the prevertebral or paraspinal soft tissue as well. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's infectious Ooh, like discitis. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So this was um, osteomyelitis discitis. You can actually see um, abscess here coming, busting out anteriorly, posteriorly. You can also see psoas abscesses. Um, interestingly, they have some calcification in them. That's a clue. Um, and then, yeah. <laughs> what do you say? Like TB, yeah. Hodge disease. Yeah, good. And then I'm gonna show you their chest. Hold on one sec. Um, a little tiny. Yeah. yeah. Tiny little nodules. Oh, oh, not tiny. No. Yeah, so this was their chest. Um, and uh, you can see that there's definitely extensive co consolidations. 
Um, what I learned, because I'm not a chest radiologist, so I had to read up, like, because I was like, oh, is this miliary TB? This is not a miliary pattern, so don't, don't trust anything I'm going to say for right now. <laughs> but um, what I learned is that in primary TB, you usually get consolidations that look just like pneumonia, although you can get granulomas that calcify, and then you get like the gone complex, et cetera. But then in uh, post-primary TB or secondary TB, which is reactivation TB, um, which is what this is, you get upper and posterior um, lobe predominant um, consolidations, but also more cavitary lesions. And then also this is the setting in which you could get miliary TB. Miliary TB wouldn't look like this with all these calcifications. It would, uh, sorry, consolidations. It would look more like tiny, tiny little nodules everywhere. And it has a much worse prognosis. Um, but anyway, so this was a patient with florid post-primary tuberculosis with a, a osteomyelitis discitis and uh, psoas abscesses. And the clue in the abscess was that there was calcification, um, which TB loves to do. Um, also, if you see necro necrotic lymph nodes with calcification, always think about TB. Uh, and you says strong work, uh, Trinity Rads. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Great Thank case. you. <laughs> I have more cases. Hold on. Uh, no problem. It's actually something I saw more. I used to work in Ethiopia, and we'd see, I'd see it quite frequently there. We actually did a lot of lung biopsies to distinguish, like, um, lung cancer from multi-drug resistant TB, but here we usually don't see it as floridly as this. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is another one for uh, the residents. Uh, I'm going to show you the coronal. What do you guys see on this image? Cystic lesion in the ligament and all the stone right. Oh, yeah. Is this like a cholodocal with ascending cholangitis and then like um, abscess pouring? Awesome. Yeah, 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 exactly. So these are multiple stones in the common bile duct, so cholidocolithiasis. And then um, as we saw here, there's all these little micro abscesses in the liver. And then there's one more finding. And kind of get a hint of it on this T2 here. I'll oh show you the post contrast as well. Oops, this is not this is motion y, but let's see if I have a better one. Nope. I guess this is my best post contrast. Yeah, uh, maybe. What'd you say? Are you talking about this, the hypo intense regions of the spleen or? Uh, no, uh, not that part, actually, in the liver still. Like, what about these dark branching structures going all the way down here? So this is the... SMV coming into the um into the splenic vein, and then this is the portal vein. So portal. Oh, oh, so it's not Nancy. Not clock. Yeah, so there's clock. yeah, there's no uh, there is signal, but it's not like a standard sort. So, uh, is there uh, thrombus within the? Exactly. So this is all septic thrombus within the portal vein and the branches of the portal vein. Um, that is called pyeleflebitis, so that's specific for portal vein septic thrombus, P-Y-E-L-E -E phlebitis, um, and it can be seen with any kind of infection that's involving the liver, so sometimes with liver abscesses that came through the bowel, but in this case, it was from the cholangitis that was causing like all of this, you know, the, the CBD stones led to cholangitis, led to basically septic um, bland thrombus throughout the, the portal venous system. Yeah. So even if it's, even if your post contrasts are bad, always look at your T2s. These are flovoids, and then you can see that we're losing the flovoid here, right? There's like fluid in the portal vein here where there should be a black flovoid. So even on these T2s, this looks like a really abnormal uh, portal vein. And then um, scrutinize your, uh, your post contrast. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, Oh, it's already three o'clock, so we're going to stop. People are saying goodbye. So have a great day, guys. Great job, and I'll see you later. Thank you. Thank nice you. job, Trinity Rides. <laughs>